morning. It's good to see you here today and uh, say hello too to those people who are watching on live stream or listening in this afternoon on our telephone line. You have, I'm sure, picked up a copy of the notices. I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things. Uh, Jane's surgery went ahead on Thursday at last. Uh, she is doing as well as can be expected and is hoping to be discharged today. I ask that you would continue to remember her in your prayers as she recovers and regains strength after major surgery. Uh, this afternoon, Dorothy and Co are hosting the Toddler's Fun Time. Uh, we wish them all the best and hope that it will be a fun time and enjoyable time to bring together those young families with children. Jane, last week you mentioned the anniversary weekend, it's the 16th to the 18th of September. There will be much more information about it, but I'm conscious that we're heading into the summer break. There will be a congregational meal on the Friday evening, uh, and for which we will have to take bookings, and then a service on the 18th of September, uh, and the new moderator, as he will be by then, will be taking part. Uh, I have a notice also from members of the church committee. Can you wait behind after church next Sunday for a very brief meeting? Thank you. You're at liberty to read the rest when you go home. As we are gathered, Jesus is here. One with each other, Jesus is here. Joined by the Spirit, washed in the blood, part of the body, the Church of God. We open our service today by singing the words of the 23rd Psalm as we find them in 527, The Lord's My Shepherd. Let us pray. Father, we come before you today to praise you for the sacrifice which you made for the redemption of your sinful people and to give thanks that we could celebrate with confidence the resurrection of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Forgive us that we forget too soon that sacrifice and we move into new weeks thinking of gardens and holidays and of ourselves, and not giving much thought again to your sacrifice until the next time we're called to celebrate it. Forgive us too that we so often live only with this world in mind, and we fail to put you first in our lives and in our worship. Accept our confessions of our failure to live out for you the faith which we claim, and for the many times when your love for us and in us has not been evident in our witness. We thank you that you are always willing to forgive and to accept us when we turn to you. We thank you that you are near to us through all the worries and concerns we may have for health and strength, for recovery from illness and surgery, for comfort for the bereaved, for reassurance for the worried, and for your everlasting love. May we go forward to love and serve you, to demonstrate the faith we profess, and to be vibrant and positive witnesses for you wherever you have placed us. All these prayers we offer in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. 
Amen. The reading today is from Hebrews chapter 11. It's quite a long chapter. I'm selecting verses from it. Hebrews 11. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of that same promise. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God would even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched round them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets. These were all condemned for their faith, yet none of them received commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Amen. We will sing now hymn 556, Father, I place into your hands. <coughs> We bring before God now our prayers for others and ourselves. Let us pray. Father, we bow before you in the sure and certain knowledge that you hear our prayers. We give thanks that Jane has had successful surgery, and we are thankful for the care and treatment she's received. We are conscious of your guiding hand throughout all our lives, and may Jane and we face the weeks ahead, assured of your presence and ongoing purposes for our lives, so that we may all continue to serve you faithfully. 
as COVID cases throughout this entire council area have increased. We pray for all who have tested positive and we give thanks for the ameliorating effects of the vaccines. We pray that all who are affected currently will be restored to full health very soon. And we remember all who are ill in any way. We bring before you those known to us. And we remember too Diane Cusick, um, one of our PCI missionaries who still remains ill in hospital. We ask that you would be with all those we know who are ill, whether they're in hospital or at home, and that they may know your presence with them and with those who care for them. We bring before you all who have been bereaved, whether known to us or not. Families where lives have been lost through violence and warfare. Families who have lost loved ones through road traffic accidents. And we think particularly of those families who have lost people in this past week at the TT races in the Isle of Man. And also for those whose loved ones have died from natural causes. Grant your comfort to all who mourn and sustain them at this time of sadness and loss. We remember too all the families and businesses who are struggling financially because of the current cost of living crisis. Guide all those who are in positions of authority as they make decisions to help alleviate this distress. Father, we ask that all who exercise political power would be wise and sensitive in the decisions they make. We bring before you advanced preparations. We remember David Vance as he prepares for the trip to Malawi. And we also bring before you all involved in the planning of the General Assembly, which will meet in two weeks' time. We give thanks for the work and witness of the Reverend Dr. David Bruce during his two years in office. And we commend to you the Reverend John Kirkpatrick as he takes up this position as moderator. And finally, Father, grant that we, your children, should show such love for you and for our neighbour, which is pure and selfless, that we should have hope in the infallible workings of your way in our lives and the faith which keeps us steadfast in your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We uh, rise and sing again hymn 512, May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. 512. Faith. It has been said that it is the greatest power in the world. If we were asked to define our faith, I wonder what our answer would be, because that would be a challenge. How do we put into words the foundation of what we believe? It's not a feeling that we manufacture. Instead, it is our response to what God has revealed to us in his word. Faith is the gift from God. And so is the air we breathe, but we have to breathe it. So is the bread and the food we eat, but we have to eat it. And so is water, but we have to drink it. So we also have to accept this gift of faith. Faith in God is our assurance, our assurance that he is always with us, just as he was with those great men and women who stepped out in faith and who were often laughed at, but with God's help they succeeded. In the Bible, faith is the act of putting our trust or reliance in something or somebody and it is always shown in the way we act. In the Bible, as of now, faith, our faith, is recognized by our deeds. The passage which I read from Hebrews 
forms a significant section of this letter, the authorship of which is unconfirmed. But what we do know is that that letter was written to second generation believers whose faith apparently was not as firm as it could be. And the readers to whom the letter was addressed initially were being tempted back to Judaism and they needed to be reminded of the solid foundation which formed their faith. It's a letter packed with practical advice and encouragement. And many of the references made are to the Old Testament with which its readers would have been so familiar. In that passage in verse 1, it described faith as this, confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Two strong, meaningful words. A Chinese missionary, J.O. Uh, Fraser, once said this about faith. He said, faith is like a muscle which grows stronger and stronger with use, rather than rubber which weakens when it's stretched. Faith is like a muscle which grows stronger and stronger with use. And this is what the ancients were commended for. And the best way for any of us to grow in faith is seen through the examples we are given in that chapter. God had spoken to each of those people. Their inner selves were stirred differently. They obeyed God and they bore witness about them. He bore witness about them. And they provide for us a blueprint of how we are to build up and strengthen our faith. And today we're going to take some time to look at the message from these many examples. And the first example given in this is of Abel. Abel, who was the first martyr for his faith. He and his brother Cain were the sons of Adam. Cain, the one who tilled the ground, and Abel, the shepherd. And both brought sacrifices to God as requested. And so the question was, why was Cain's offering rejected and Abel's accepted? And it's not because God preferred Abel's lamb offering to the fruits of the soil offered by Cain. The difference was in the attitude of the brothers. Abel's sacrifice was offered in true, worshipful faith. He gave the very best that he had from the firstlings of his flock. He held nothing back from God. While Cain's heart was not right, he offered just from a sense of duty and not from a true desire to worship God. And then in his anger, he would proceed to kill his brother and was subsequently banished by God. Abel is even described by Jesus in Matthew 23 as one who is righteous. And he is to be our example of faith worshipping, of having the requisite awe and respect for our God and Saviour, as those who come to God in the way that he requires. In the instance with Abel and Cain, God wanted an animal sacrifice to be offered and killed in place of human sinfulness. And so Abel's sacrifice points to Christ's sacrifice for our sins. But it also reminds us about our attitude. If we come to God with an attitude of reverence and worship, our faith and what it moves us to be and to do will be acceptable to God. And we have to ask ourselves, is that our style? Is our attitude one of reverence as we come to worship? And will it help to strengthen our faith? And the second person mentioned is Enoch. This time, Enoch is an example 
of faith walking. Enoch is so often referred to as the one who walked with God and who eventually was taken up to heaven. Now, what image does walking conjure to us? Obviously, it's not static. It involves activity. And this is what our faith should be. As believers, we are commanded to walk and to live in a manner worthy of the Lord, according to the spirit and newness of life and in love, in good works and in truth. And we have a duty to demonstrate our faith in the way that we live, in the way we share, and the way we care for others as well as for ourselves. I read recently uh, a little clip about someone who said to their minister, you know, it's really all about basin theology. Basin theology. And he wondered what on earth it meant. And it was explained like this. In this time when we're looking at Jesus on his way to the cross, the basin was brought to Pilate who washed his hands of him. Just before that, a basin was lifted by Jesus, who sat down and washed the disciples' feet. And the question to us is, are we going to wash our hands, or are we going to be the one who serves? To keep God's commandments is becoming increasingly difficult in this secular society we inhabit. And Enoch's life is notable not just because of what he did, but because of how God's glory and greatness were demonstrated through him. He has much to teach us. He resisted the world's corruption. He sought God diligently, and he lived in obedience to him. Can we honestly say that we are examples of faith walking? in this increasingly dark world? Do we resist the world's corruption? Do we seek God diligently? And are we living in obedience to him? The third, then, is the story of Noah. Noah is probably well known to us. He is a good example of faith working. Of course, we can all tell the story of how he built the ark into which the animals went two by two, and only he, his wife, and their three sons and their wives were saved from the flood which destroyed the earth at that time. That flood, which was God's punishment on a disobedient people, would rank among the great catastrophes known to man. Noah and his family floating on the surface of turbulent water in a crude barge. It's the stuff of children's stories. But I think we also need to remember that at the time when God told Noah to build the ark, the people among whom he lived had never experienced a flood. Indeed, it's unlikely they would have even had ever seen heavy rainfall. However, Noah had faith, faith which was put to work in the face of much ridicule. He labored long and hard, following closely the instructions which God had given to him. Some scholars actually think it could have taken as long as 120 years to build the ark, and I suspect his sense of urgency may even have waned along the way. Perhaps God was giving those people time to reflect on their wickedness and to repent. But remember, too, that Noah and his wife were rearing three sons in the midst of the wicked world around them. But they stood firm in the faith which God, they had in God who had promised to save them. Noah worked as God had commanded him putting his heart, his mind, his will into the task in hand, serving his God in spite of the taunts and ridicules which surrounded him. And his example should be an encouragement for all of us. 
because when our faith directs us to work for God, it is his opinion alone which matters, not what others in this world may think or even say about us. And it makes us think, are we willing to stand true to God in a world which is drifting away from him? And then we have the patriarchs. Four generations from Abraham through Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph are perfect examples of faith waiting. The example of Abraham as a man of faith is particularly well known. His faith was evident when he went without question from Ur, where he was well respected, to a strange land, where he lived as a nomad in tents and waited for that child, possibly 25 years, for the son that God had promised him when he had assured him he would become the father of a great nation. He, and with his wife Sarah, believed God's promise and served him even as their age advanced. Abraham's son, Isaac, living in his father's shadow, but he too was a man of faith. A young man who could probably have overpowered his father when they headed to the sacrificial altar, but he too must have believed that God would provide. Now he would, in his own time, be guilty of favoring Esau over Jacob, but if we read the scriptures, we will see that God had already decreed that it would be Jacob who would carry the father's blessing. Jacob himself would later be deceived and would suffer such grief when he believed that his own son Joseph had been killed. But he would eventually demonstrate trust in God's ability to keep his promises. And out of Jacob's long life, it's the blessing he bestowed on Joseph's sons, which is singled out in Hebrews as the outstanding example of his faith. He remembered that his line and God's blessing on it would continue, that God had guided them and that he was now fulfilling his promises to Abraham. The story of Joseph is also well known and provides illustration of his brotherly love of good stewardship and patient perseverance. But it's not the main message. God used Joseph's suffering to accomplish his sovereign purposes. The example of Joseph's life and faith is reflected in the letter to the Romans, when we are reminded that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. injustice. His was a faith which warred, and he became an example of faith to the Israelites, God using him to deliver the people from slavery, and that too was a work of faith from beginning to end. At each crucial step in the deliverance of his people, Moses put his trust in the God who will not fail. He knew that faith from his parents who'd worked to save him from the slaughter of the innocent boys. He made the choice to follow God and turn away from the privileges of his early life. A man who, although 80 years old when he was called by God, did not flinch from the challenge ahead, but who stood up to the Pharaoh. 
the one who led the Israelites across the Red Sea and through 40 years in the wilderness. Where are we in our faith journey now? Are we still enjoying the world without any thought of God and faith? Are we in the wilderness or are we safely on the journey to the promised land, prepared to speak up and act against the injustices which abound? And Moses, of course, didn't actually cross into the promised land. But we are provided in Hebrews with two examples of faith winning, Joshua and Rahab. The people of Israel felt that they were facing an impossible situation as they looked at the promised land. Many believed they had left slavery behind, but were now being faced with a greater enemy following the report from the spies whom Moses had sent to view the land God had promised to them, which had large, fortified cities and was filled with giants. Only Joshua and Caleb had the faith which claimed that God would give them the victory. And the second great hero of faith mentioned here is that very unlikely figure of Rahab. Rahab possibly possibly a high-class prostitute, but who knew all about the God who had already won battles, and she feared for her family and herself. Offering sanctuary to spies, helping them to safety, and in return, asking for protection for her family. She seems to be the least likely to be included in this list of faith heroes. She was a woman. She was not a Jew, and she was a prostitute. But what is clear in Scripture is that she demonstrated outstanding trust in God in a remarkable act of courage. In the letter that James writes that we have in the New Testament, we read that she was considered righteous because of what she did. And she also features in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, she would eventually marry Solomon. Their son was Boaz. You remember him who married Ruth. Their son Obed, their grandson Jesse, their great-grandson King David. What a story of faith winning. But it is also a stark reminder to all of us that when we turn to God, we can and we will be changed forever. He no longer holds on to the old you, but gives us a chance to be a new creation in him and to live the life of faith which will win. What a hall of fame they are, and how much can we learn from them? Are we like Abel, whose faith is obvious in our worship, in our attitude to it, and in our heart. Will we, like Enoch, walk with God each and every day, following his way and active in our faith? Will we, like Noah, be prepared to work for and how God directs us, regardless of the attitude or ridicule of others? Will we, like the patriarchs, wait patiently for God's plan in our, for our lives to be revealed? Will we, like Moses, fight for what is right in God's sight and against injustice? And will we, like Joshua and Rahab, accept God as our savior and guide and face the unknown knowing that if God is on our side, we need never be afraid? There is a song that says, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. At the outset, I said that faith can be described as a muscle which is strengthened by exercise. And the onus is on each one of us now to build that muscle by exercising our faith. And may we all commit to doing so. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the examples of faith which we have, 
And we ask that you would enable each one of us, wherever we are within our Christian faith at this time, to grow in that faith, to be seen to be people who are yours by the love and service which we give to you and to others. And we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We bring our service to a close by singing hymn five, uh, 155, Your hand, O God, has guided your church from age to age, and we will omit verse 3. So that's hymn 155, omitting verse 3. <coughs> Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to make us stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>